Okay, we're going to talk about chapter 14, which is collecting of non-blood specimens. Um, this will be a fairly quick lecture um, because most of this, you know, you're going to be reviewing in your textbook, of course. It's basically going over the steps of different specimens, collecting of different specimens that you may be responsible for as a phlebotomist. Um, and then we're going to get some hands-on experience with some of, these, some of the equipment for this type of testing. So, let's see. We're going to talk about the different types of swabs. Um, that we might, or I should say the test that use swabs, um, sputum, stool, urine, and a few other non-blood specimens. So swab specimens, basically sterile swabs can be used to test for a variety of things. Um, and this can be different um, illnesses that require culturing, so growing something and detecting if there's any microorganisms or certain microorganisms present. Um, type of swab that you're going to use, it's going to depend on the specific area you're culturing. And what I mean by that is your, is it your nose, is it your throat, et cetera. When you do a swab specimen, you want to make sure that you label the location of the specimen, so where you took that specimen from. Keep in mind that even these swabs have expiration dates. So if it's expired, you can't guarantee its sterility, and it can't guarantee that it's going to be effective in growing the culture that we want it to grow. Let's talk about throat swabs. So these are samples that are taken from the back of the throat. These for screening like strep um, or different cultures that, um, of microorganisms from the throat that we may want to isolate. But again, most common, you're probably gonna see strep. These um, swabs have a culture media. So that test tube, once you've done the swab, it's gonna go into a test tube that has a culture media at the bottom. And so when that swab makes contact with that culture media, it makes sure that the microorganism stays alive and viable so that it can grow and be tested. On page 283 in your textbook, that says 383, I'm sorry, I just noticed that. Two, 283, am I right? No, I was wrong, it is 383. On 383 of your textbook, it's gonna go over step-by-step -step procedure for a throat swab. So we've got nasal and nasopharyngeal swabs, two different things. A nasal swab takes samples from the nose, okay, just inside the nares. You might be testing for something like MRSA in the nares. Remember, that's an a antibiotic-resistant staph infection. These swabs are also going to go into a, um, a container that has a transport media that helps to keep those microorganisms moist and viable as well. This one's on page 385 in your textbook to review over the step-by-step -step process. Now, what's the difference between nasal and nas nasopharyngeal? So that picture that you see on there is a nasopharyngeal. This is going beyond just the nares. This is taken from the nasopharynx, which is the upper part of the throat behind the nose, which is why you go in through the nose. This is gonna test for things like, if you've ever gotten a flu test or COVID test, this is what's being done. This is why it makes your eyes water, right? Swabs also, just like the nasal, uh, nasal swabs, have to be kept moist on their, in their medium. Um, and so they're kept wet when they're, that, that swab is dipped into that medium, and then it can be tested. Some facilities only allow nursing personnel to do nasopharyngeal. So the nasal, different nasopharyngeal, some places, again, only nursing staff may do those. This one is on page 386 for that step-by-step -step review and do make sure to review. They're gonna be very similar, but make sure you review the differences. All right, let's talk about sputum specimens. So what is sputum? That is mucus, that's that gunk that we're gonna cough up from the very bottom of our lungs. Um, it's used in diagnosing a variety of, of respiratory tract um, infections and for identifying those specific microorganisms that are making us sick but there is a pro proper process that we have to go through to get a specimen that's not contaminated. First, you've got to have your patient rinse out their mouth with water, so kind of gargle, swish, and then spit. You're gonna give them a tissue to kind of cover their mouth while they're coughing, to prevent any um, contamination. And before they cough, before they try, you need to instruct them. They're gonna to want to produce a deep cough from the bottom of their lungs, and then spit that into the specimen container. On 
All right, stool specimens. So stool specimens are also used to diagnose a variety of things going on in our GI system or our digestive tract. Stool specimens can be stool culture, cultures. We can do fecal fat analysis, um, hemoglobin screenings, so checking for blood, or ova and parasite for checking for different parasites in the stool. You might be responsible, as a phlebotomist, sometimes we're responsible for instructing the patients on how to proper, properly collect these different specimens. So make sure whichever specimen you are instructing your patient how to collect, you've read over the standard operating procedures and the manual to make sure that you're giving the appropriate instructions, okay? Semen collection. This is something, again, you might be responsible for instructing the patient for proper collection. So of course, males produce sperm. Um, there's other substances in sperm like fructose and, and different acids that are necessary for fertilization. So sometimes semen collection is done to help figure out what's going on with infertility issues. It's also done, let's say a, a, a male has a vasectomy because he's not planning to have any more kids. I mean, his significant other, maybe you're not planning to have any more kids, may get a vasectomy. And then a semen collection is done after the vasectomy to confirm that it actually worked, right? The most accurate results um, for semen collection are obtained 48 to 72 hours after of, of abstinence from any sexual activity. And it's important to know as the phlebotomist, if we're collecting these specimens, that they have to kept, be kept at near body temperature and delivered to the lab within 30 minutes for testing. So urine specimens, this is a big one because we can do a lot of different things with urine specimens. And I'm gonna review over a few of those, okay? All right, so urines, urine tests can be done for glucose, drugs, alcohol, just general well-being, um, urinary tract infections, et cetera. The first morning void, like you see there, that's the best specimen when we're doing just routine testing and evaluating general health. It's the most concentrated, so it's gonna contain the highest levels of the chemicals that are present in our urine. Something to, and I think it's actually on the next slide, but if for some reason urine cannot be um, tested within one hour, it needs to be refrigerated. If it's left at room temperature for over that hour, a few things can change. The color and clarity, um, bacterial growth can increase. Um, our pH and our nitrites can change. Cellular, cellular elements might change from their true level or value. Um, and that might include like the glucose or the bilirubin or the ketones. So if they were initially present in the first place, over time, they're gonna decrease and not give us that clear picture. So obtaining urine specimens, let me see. I'm sorry, I skip around slides on this. Okay, no, nope, I'm good. So um, a random void. That is basically a specimen collected any time of day, doesn't matter, it's a random void. Um, but sometimes you're requested to do a clean catch specimen and your job as the phlebotomist, sometimes we're instructing patients on how to make sure they get an accurate clean catch. And that's gonna involve cleaning the skin first with a cleanser, usually a little towel, comes prepackaged individually. And you have to instruct the individual to clean themselves with that. And you'll actually look in your book, I forgot to mention the page number for that, but it does tell you the steps um, and how to clean and catch a clean catch urine in female versus male. And when we catch clean um, catch, the other thing is that we're doing it midstream. So you're gonna make sure the individual understands that they're gonna start their stream of urine and catch after it's already started. So midstream. A 24 hour urine collection. Um, this is required to measure the total amount of substances, whatever they're looking for, such as protein, sodium, hormones, over a 24 hour period and how they're excreted in the yard over 24 hours. So you, can, you are often responsible as a phlebotomist for preparing the collection containers for this and then giving instructions to patients as well. Sometimes pre preservatives are not always needed for 24 hour urine collection, but sometimes they are. And because you might be performing these, make sure you're using all safety precautions and know how to do it appropriately. Because sometimes we're adding things like acids and chloroform, okay? Dangerous, right? So remember, we talked about this a little bit in one of our earliest chapters. If we're having to add acids, we always wanna add acid to the water. You wanna wear your appropriate PPE and use um, the chemical fume hood when you're adding these different additives. 
It's important to remember that during a 24 hour urine collection, these specimens have to be kept on ice or refrigerated. And the other important factor, this is urine collection starts with an empty bladder and ends with an empty bladder. So what that means is you wake up in the morning, you void, and then the very next void is your first void in the 24 hour period, okay? This you can review on page 394 in your textbook as well. Sometimes we have to collect urine specimens for legal reasons, okay? Um, and so just don't forget, we reviewed this in a previous chapter. This is gonna involve the chain of custody and very, being very careful about our documentation and keeping that specimen, um, the integrity of the specimen intact. Um, these are just some examples of different devices that we use to collect urine. Um, sometimes urine is collected with a Foley catheter bag. This is done for a pediatric um, patient and then a urinary hat, which can go in the toilet and collect urine there. Um, there are some other non-blood specimens that um, may need to be collected. And though you, you don't typically have a role in actually collecting those specimens, um, just like with some of these other ones, you may be involved in the kind of processing of the orders, the transportation and the handling of these um, specimens. So it is important to be aware of those. And you can see on table 14-2 in your textbook, which is on pages 395 and 396, we're gonna get you introduced and get you kind of familiar with some of those other specimens that you may be um, not collecting, but you may be assisting with. And I think that's it, folks. I told you that one's gonna be short and sweet. So that is it. Thank you.